Canales. On come to the Maintenant, we have our next panel, which is cross-border payment infrastructure and central bank digital currencies in Africa. And we have the perfect moderator for this session in Camille Cadet, the founder and CEO of MTech, who is working on the Bahamanian Sand Dollar Project. She is joined by two spectacular panelists. We welcome Mance Harmon, the CEO de Hedera Hashgraf, et aussi Monsieur Ian Potter, the chef de DLT, a blockchain avec Standard Bank. Hi, my name is Karma Cadet. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of MTech. Uh, we are a fintech for central banks, but today I have the pleasure of moderating a panel uh, of two leaders in their industries. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, but today we're, we'll be talking to Hedera and Standard Bank on the, uh, the heels of their partnership together, uh, looking at uh, cross-border payment, distributed ledger technology, transforming banking, and I think this is a very exciting conversation. Uh, so Mens, I'll start with you. Please introduce yourself and then we'll go to Ian. Um, I have some very good questions and uh, we'll have a good conversation. Okay, great. Hi, Carmel, and hello, Ian. It's good to see you both. I'm Mance Harmon, CEO and co-founder of Hedera Hashgraph. Hedera is a layer one protocol platform. Uh, it uses something called the Hashgraph, which is an alternative to blockchain. It has fantastic performance and security. And probably most noteworthy about Hedera is its governing council, Hedera is governed by a group currently of 21 of global enterprises, including Standard Bank. And, um, and it's, it you know, includes others like Google and IBM and LG and, and Nomura and uh, DLA Piper. It's a broad range uh, global council that provides the oversight of the organization and all things associated with the, the governance of, of the platform. I'll start again. I'm Ian Pate from Standard Bank. I'm the head of the Blockchain Center of Excellence. Uh, we started working with Adira last year and formally announced uh, that we joined the, the council early this year. We're also working with a lot of council members and the use cases is a lot broader than payments, uh, stable coins. We're looking at various use cases with Adira and the council members. I'm very excited about it. And I think, as I said, we... We're moving very, very quickly. I hope to, to, to implement a few use cases in this still in 2021. So very excited about the rest of the year. All right. So it sounds like we're off to, to some goals and to um, some deadlines before the end of the year. So maybe we can start there. I mean, Hedera in Standard Bank, what are some of the opportunities in Africa specifically um, that bring you together. Standard Bank is uh, an established uh, Pan-African bank. Um, can you talk more about what did you guys discuss? What brought you guys together on this collaboration? Mons, can I go first? Yes, please. Go right ahead. Okay, so, so we're looking at, at various um, initiatives. Um, we've already connected with... DLA Piper, which is a council member. We're going to look at the TOCO tokenization service with DLA Piper. We're also looking at self-sovereign identity to build something. We've got a, a, a timeline already for the next 25 weeks to deliver on that. And then a very interesting uh, initiative for me personally is the bond exchange that we're working on with Adira, also doing research with them. I'm very excited about that. That's uh, it's a significant use case where we want to see if we can issue a bond also later in this year on the Adira network. And then uh, from a stablecoin perspective, we're working closely with Adira to help us with the Standard Bank stablecoin. And that is for me another uh, interesting solution that will facilitate payments across the group and potentially later, depending on regulatory approval, all these are, there's lots of regulatory participation, uh, audit participation. We are a regulated entity, but 
there are a few of these use cases in the market. So I think we must just consistently keep our regulator on board. Those are some of the key initiatives that we're looking at. So we're looking at uh, commoditizing agricultural products also with some of the bank's customers across Africa. And um, a very interesting use case is BioHab, the Corporate Social Investment Initiative at Standard Bank, where we're partnering with Adira and Fjord to help us to create a sustainable solution, uh, building houses and um, providing food to people across Africa. Great. So, uh, I mean, those are quite a few use cases, Ian. Uh, men's, maybe you can mention why Hedera? Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about blockchain, distributed ledger technology. Um, what makes Hedera unique for something like this? I've been very curious on the hashgraph technology. And as you know, we're, we're, we're very fascinated by the energy efficiency component that you guys have as well. But um, why, why Hedera? Yeah, uh, well, there are several reasons. One is Hashgraph. The technology is, of course, very important if you are building these types of applications on top of a public ledger. Hashgraph resolves the major problems associated with first-gen te technology, specifically proof-of-work blockchain, right? We think about Bitcoin and Ethereum and the amount of energy that's required to run those systems. Uh, it's enormous, obviously, that everyone understands that but it's also very slow. Um, today in the current version of the platform, which is still beta, we can process, we have capacity for up to 10,000 transactions per second. And we expect that to go up many fold and that's within a single shard. You know, We will ultimately have multiple shards and we'll scale through a sharded solution. We have many hundreds of thousands or millions of transactions per second for a certain class of, of use cases. So the performance is a big deal. You have to have performance. And if you have the performance, then the costs come down. Today, our costs per transaction are a tiny fraction of a cent compared to many dollars or tens of dollars or sometimes hundreds of dollars for those first gen technologies. And they're denominated in USD. So anybody that's building an application on top of the platform doesn't have to worry about their ongoing costs and, and what those are going to be or how those are subject to market fluctuations of, of the token price. In our case, developers can easily predict what their hard costs are going to be for the application running, running on our platform. So, you know, those are tech focused, but I think that the council is equally important. It's important that uh, anyone building an enterprise grade solution on the platform, any public one uh, public platform knows and trusts the governing body behind the organization. Who is it that is making the decisions on what the product roadmap will be? And who is it that is setting and managing their legal and regulatory posture and, and strategy for the organization? and managing things like treasury and, and setting pricing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've intentionally uh, built a governing council that is representative of the global marketplace of use cases and, and relatively focused on enterprise grade solutions. Certainly works for small and medium bis business applications as well, obviously, but from the beginning, we wanted the platform to be robust in the sense that the tech is robust, but also the governance of the platform is robust and managed by world-class organizations. And so it's, it's both of those things. It's the combination of those things that provides the, um, the value proposition to organizations like Standard Bank, giving them the, the trust and confidence that they can build on a platform, the Hedera platform, and, and know that it's gonna be around for decades to come and that their investments aren't gonna be wasted. Great, I mean, let, maybe let's pick up on that. The participation of Standard Bank, the significance of having a, an African institution as part of your council, um, looking at trade in Africa specifically, what does this mean? What 
does this relationship mean for the coverage that Hedera can have, but also the use cases that Hedera can support? Because in Africa, we have unique requirements and, and it's a unique market too. Well, so first off, Standard Bank is running a node in the network, meaning that they, they are our first uh, node in Africa, which is a big deal for us, right? We, we wanted to have global coverage uh, geographically and, and they've made it possible. So we now have a node running in Africa, uh, which is important. Now, the, the network, when I say they are running a node, the network, the Hedera network is um, enabled, created by the council members. Every council member is, is, has a responsibility for running a node and the network is created by the council members. And, and that will grow over time to up to 39 formal council members. And then there will be community nodes on top of that and ultimately anonymous nodes. Uh, in sort of the final step of this journey that we're on. But today um, we have representation now in that geography, which is really important. The Standard Bank and, and Africa generally represent uh, you know, an opportunity for a whole set of use cases. They're important for that part of the world. Uh, I think, and I know Ian can talk uh, far more in depth than I can on this, but, but some of the key challenges, one of the key challenges is multi-currency settlement for the region. And what Hedera provides is the ability to have a global or universal settlement layer that includes Africa, obviously, and currencies and assets can be tokenized uh, using our Hedera token service. Mm -hmm. And that makes the ownership and exchange of those assets direct and more seamless. That's part of the value proposition that Hedera brings to the table. And, um, you know, Ian, maybe Ian, you could pick up with that, but, but um, you know, Hedera token service is one of the key services that will be used by Standard Bank in, in the use cases. Yeah, you can think about it. Um, if you look at micropayments and if you look at uh, wholesale settlements where there's FX involved, the solutions today require you to do FX conversions, lots of uh, participants in uh, cross-border transactions. And one of the key things that I think we Hedera is going to help us uh, significantly speed that up and reduce costs significantly is um, to facilitate through tokens and stable coins value transfer seamlessly across the border, still governed very, very well. Um, taking uh, care of uh, AML, um, KYC, all those components. That's why we're building a, a few solutions on, on Hedera. And um, we've done, for the last three years, we've got a live uh, uh, payments blockchain on Hyperledger. And to integrate Hyperledger, and I mustn't use the word to interoperate, is actually the, the benefit for us at this stage to make that private permission blockchain more uh, widely available and speed it up significantly. And that it's not a, a blockchain that's controlled by Standard Bank, but that, we've, but that we're using the inter, independent verification network to enable us to get other participants to also participate on that, on that network. And then the capabilities and the, the H bar that Adira has got facilitate cross border payments as well, which you typically don't find in the private permission blockchains. So I think for us, that's a leap forward. We've worked for three years and then we joined Adira, and I think that's helping us to scale and exploit what we've got, but also to build brand new solutions. All right, so you, you touched on something that's very interesting, I think even to the broader community around digital currencies and digital assets, but definitely for the Hedera community, I think. Um, stable coins and digital currency right now into payments. Um, we hear stable coins, we hear Bitcoin, we hear uh, uh, CBDCs. How do those things come together um, to facilitate trade? I, I I, I spent a lot of time thinking about CBDCs. Um, 
and have an appreciation that the currency itself is not the only solution, that the use case around trade is very powerful on changing the dynamics and making and creating value too. Um, so what do you see here? What, 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 what are you thinking on around how this technology can help you provide interoperability and also token-based, non-token-based, private and public? Are you asking me? Uh, both of you, maybe you can start and then okay. we'll, we'll, we'll go to that. Yeah, I think tokenization, if you, a lot of people look at settlements in isolation, but if you look at the tokenization of financial instruments, if you look at the wholesale, wholesale side of the business, where payments are quite expensive and it's a separate process. I'm a chartered accountant as well. So from an accounting perspective, if you look at the revolution that distributed ledger technology is bringing, it's actually disrupting the way that we're doing the double entry bookkeeping, mm -hmm. where you've got separate ledgers. And a, a lot of people don't get this, but this is extremely important. And if you do accounting today, you've got cash accounts and you've got reconciliations and back office, back office operations that manage the cash, the Nostra accounts, the settlements, all of that is a whole operation. And then you've got the financial instruments where you buy and sell assets that's digitized, not tokenized though, that's also got these underlying back office operations. But by integrating or, or putting that whole process, tokenizing your financial instruments, derivatives, bonds, and then also having this cash that's now a token, think of Bitcoin or crypto, or th that process then becomes integrated that, that when the settlements occur on the underlying financial instrument, there's no clearing. It's a seamless process that happens instantaneously. Um, on swaps, if there's a reset date, if you think about foreign exchange, when the, the, the forward exchange contract matures, the settlement will happen automatically. And the thing is, if you use a stable coin to settle that, you don't have to physically go and convert the cash, have all these accounts. You can have one. Um, if you look at Standard Bank or any global bank today, they will have multiple Nostra accounts uh, for different currencies, a Rand dollar, a Naira dollar, Kenyan shilling dollar. And if you put it on a distributed ledger, you can have one Nostra account and you can basically automate or disintermediate all the, the processes and reconciling that FX transactions. So a lot of people will, will, will feel I'm a very revolutionary in what I'm saying, but that's possible. It's not even possible. It's essential that that happens because the thing is it's unnecessary to run all these processes and then trace data back from the underlying transactions to the source systems. If you put it on a blockchain, you've got this integrated network with buyers and sellers the ecosystem and you've got the protocol that manages all these underlying operational components for you seamlessly in real time and as man's mentioned at a fraction of a cent um, if you if you go and analyze that's maybe some other research we can do in futures if you go and under, analyze that the underlying transactional cost per transaction today people typically look at the settlement side and say that it's fairly efficient but they forget about all the other reconciliations, you know, to bring all those transactions together. And I think what, what the is getting right with the scale and the volumes, the, the number of transactions they can process at that cost, plus the governance that it brings. Because one benefit of Adira for me was the fact that the reporting and the governance is embedded in this, in this uh, technology, or I don't want to call it technology, solution or this decentralized capability, let me call it that functionality. You can basically integrate all that functionality on this and then your customers will benefit. They will, there's transparency, traceability. Think of all the benefits that you've got on a, that you've got on a distributed ledger. Historically, you would have had to track and trace the cash. You would have had to track and trace the transactions. Now all those things becomes one thing Conceptually, I think it makes a lot of sense what I'm saying. If you know what I'm trying to say, it basically integrates all those ledgers that you've got one integrated version of the truth. And both the buyer and the seller in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction can follow and see the transactions. You don't have to call call centers and say, I settled someone in the US, I still haven't received my package. What's happening here? Everything is integrated. You can track the package. You can see the settlement being through 
the cash disappears from your from your rent account. The big benefit for me is in future you when when you when you off ramped from fiat, let me say when you on ramp into to the, the crypto or the the token, you won't have to redeem that token. Many people can use that token to settle. And when you want to go back into similar to crypto, if you want to go back eventually into fiat, then all the regulatory requirements will be met. But the efficiencies from stable coins and tokens facilitate meting and settlement and set-offs that we typically struggle with doing today. We're paying lots of companies globally money to help us to compress our assets and liabilities. On a distributed ledger, you can do that meeting seamlessly and very easily. Well said, well said. Mens, thoughts, thoughts on that? I mean, you're probably seeing a, a lot of use cases around tokenization, stable coins, um, CBDCs. There is a value chain too, kind of growing here around money. Um, and then you get into that efficiency layer um, what what does that mean for for Hedera and of course the use cases that Hedera can support? Yeah, uh, well, so most everything that Ian was just talking about takes advantage or would use the Hedera token service, which is a service that makes it possible for anyone to issue a token. And of course, there are all there's a huge variety of token types. CBDCs uh, would be considered one type and stable coins would be considered perhaps a different type. And then there, you know, uh, fungible, non-fungible tokens, NFTs that we've all seen in the press and, you know, all of that, there, you know, there are probably a, 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 at least a dozen different token types that could be formally categorized and, and issued on the Hedera token service. But what's interesting is how the market has evolved in the past couple of years as it relates really to tokenization. And Ian touched on this. Um, you know, in the early days of DLT, and I say early days here, I'm thinking back five, six or seven years, everyone understood that there was value there in, uh, let's, choose a, let's choose supply chain as a use case. You know, the supply chain use case goes way back and everyone understood that if you were creating or building a widget and it was flowing through a supply chain, then having a common view across participants in that supply chain of that widget and where it exists and who owns it, et cetera, et cetera, there was value in that. But we've now evolved to the point where instead of having this ledger that has um, rows of, of widgets and the provenance associated with those widgets. Now the widgets have their own token and the token by its design is meant for economic activity, for the transference from one party to another. Mm -hmm. Now the token holds the same information. It holds all that provenance information mm -hmm. and the token can be exchanged at various points in time in the supply chain process for uh, other tokens or for, for cash. This is where, of course, both CFI and DeFi come into play. Mm -hmm. You can take tokens associated with widgets flowing down a supply chain and go get a capital loan against those tokens. Or maybe later in the supply chain uh, process, you, you transfer the tokens when the, the widgets go to a distributor. And now you get an accounts receivable token back, right? You get an AR token back. You can take those tokens and go factor them in a, in a CFI or, or DeFi context, right? Componentized finance embedded into digital workflows that, have, that are associated with real world assets, right? That is the future of finance. And, um, that, and, and stable coins are going to be required, you know, they're going to play a critical role in that process and in the exchange of token types, et cetera, through that process. The entire world is going to be tokenized. Everything you mm -hmm. see in touch is going to be tokenized. And I think what Ian and Standard Bank are doing is recognizing that fact and putting in place the infrastructure to be ready for that eventuality and, and be a leader as a result. And I think as I listen to you, it's 
it's exciting. I, I, I get it. It's, this is a future that's developing and you guys are, are at the forefront of building different pieces and different components of it that are needed. Um, but the audience might hear us and say, what this crazy world of finance we're talking about here, but this is already happening. I mean, we can see the, the, the foundation being created um, the early prototypes that came forward around supply chain and Bitcoin was a big proof point around the tokenization of assets um, and creating value around something that um, can be used that freely. And I actually believe as, as crazy as it might sound, but if the benefits that we you guys just laid out and the efficiency that can happen um, is, is, is delivered, people will just naturally gravitate to that type of infrastructure because it would be easier to do accounting reconciliation. It would be easier to um, get liquidity in a market. Think about the, the number of days that it takes a transfer to really be complete and the funds are not available to anyone really, or maybe to someone and the other is kind of losing on, on, on this float. And you know, it's just the, if the, the mechanism behind the scenes that Ian was talking about, we don't always have an appreciation for it. If you're a typical user, you know, going to your bank or trying to make a, a transfer to another country, maybe you see the difficulty from an endpoint perspective, but the infrastructure behind the scene and the complexity that's driving the cost up and payments is not always visible. So now when you talk about that, that level of being able to break down that efficient, that, that infrastructure and replace it with something that it's a token and the token can float um, into, into different worlds that creates a different set of economies. I think it's fascinating. Um, so, so there's a lot of talk about AFCA, right? The Africa uh, Trade Free Continental Agreement um, that was ratified last year. Um, in the midst of COVID, for as, as difficult things were, uh, you know, there was, there's been really good progress, I would say, compared to the previous efforts um, on moving this forward. I think a lot of people see the opportunity um, and, and the potential around that. Um, we have a big focus on, on Africa and we always say, you know, this is such a unique opportunity between the, the, the paradigm shift that we were just talking about here um, on digital currency and tokenization of assets. And now you're having the probably one of the biggest trade agreements um, that to, to come right now you know, for me, it's like, you know, you have to go blockchain, you have to go distributed ledger. There's no other way to do this, right? Because by the time you implement this stuff five, 10 years later, you're going to turn around and, and say, wait, well, you know, we should have done something that was future proof. What What are you guys doing um, uh, around Africa? What are, what are you thinking? And Ian, maybe from a banking perspective, and and then Hedera, are, are you are you thinking about investment? Are you, because this is a really big opportunity. What are you thinking? Last question. Sorry. Yeah, so um, we, you won't believe it, but we're actually working with, um, we are working with the DERA and uh, we've got a partnership with MIT, where the guys are looking, there's a few execs in the bank that's looking at the free trade agreement. And I spoke earlier about commoditizing some of those uh, products or commoditizing or tokenizing, sorry, see, I'm confused already. You're not commodity, you're tokenizing. You're not digitizing, you're tokenizing commodities. And that's what they're already doing. So we've started talking to Adira and there are solutions that the guys are leveraging off to support that free trade agreement between the different countries. And they looked at the trade regulations between different countries. So we are putting a few of those use cases. We're already busy um, working on POCs, um, prototypes with Adira, luckily. Um, what I wanted to say earlier, a lot of, in a lot of cases, there are already solutions that's been built that we can leverage off. So it's not going to take forever, you know, to reinvent the wheel and build these things on the ledger. There's lots of use cases that we can piggyback on to facilitate all the different components of these free trade agreements. And I think a point that I didn't raise earlier, that's actually for me essential in distributed ledger technology is inclusion and democratization because of the low cost. The world is, is gonna to be totally different. I think that if you look at the way that we used to build things across the world, it was very methodical and it was like step one, two, three, four, five, six. If you build things on a distributed ledger, you can disintermediate all those processes immediately and you can democratize it. So if you tokenize things, 
many years ago, there was equities and then there was the dematerialization when we moved from paper. And I remember when I had my first shares, they, email, they mailed you, not email, they physically mailed you a certificate for your shares. And now today, when you buy something at online share training or an exchange, it's sitting in your account and you can check it digitally. And tokenization is just the next level where you basically build this peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. And when you create that, it's going to be what the internet did for communication and information. Value. People of all levels will be able to start investing in bonds. Typically today, if there's bond issuance, big counterparties take the bulk of that. But your, your normal guy on the street also wants exposure to those bonds. Secure for pension. Someone might want to invest money. Uh, 10,000 or 100,000 rands. And typically we don't cater for that in the wholesale markets. So I think what blockchain in this free trade agreement can also facilitate is that you can get a lot more people participating in these commodities, creating huge liquidity. And um, what, I say, what I'm going to say now might be very controversial, but maybe blurring the world between retail and wholesale. That in future, you're not going to get this huge guys funding these projects, but millions of people across the world could participate. That is what distributed ledger and democratization and tokenization bring. It's really the next level of evolution. And I, I think I we've think got to leave it if we don't have a choice. I don't think I expected to hear that from a bank on the blurring of wholesale and retail. So kudos. <laughs> I we have some thoughts on that too. No, no, but that's uh, my personal I don't see yeah, so yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I mean, you're not the first one. You're not the first one to make the case. I'll, I'll give you that. You're not the first one to make that case. But it is an interesting use case because that's another layer of efficiency around. Um, you know, we had large payment systems versus small payment systems. Is there a need for for both in parallel? Um, is there more efficiency to be gained? So that's very interesting. Uh, Mince, over to you. Uh, Africa, Africa, trade. Yeah. Well, I mean, the relationship with Ian and Standard Bank is very strategic to us, uh, and and we're delighted to to be partnered. Um, we are actively looking for other council members from the continent, from the region, and would welcome. You know, we're we're there are ongoing efforts to to that end, and so uh, keeping my fingers crossed that we'll be successful there in, in the coming months. Um, so Hedera, you know, it enables the, the use cases that we've talked about. I think what Ian touched on there at the end is, you know, bond issuance. When people think about what's going on in the world of DeFi and, you know, all the buzz and the hype that's associated with DeFi, it just pales in comparison to what the reality would be if we can achieve what Ian is, is pursuing there and issuing bonds or tokenizing bonds or sort of democratization of, of that asset class. That alone is huge, right? And um, so I, I think that's all very exciting. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out over time. And, uh, you know, again, we're just delighted to be able to participate and, and provide the infrastructure that makes some of this possible. Very good. Well, exciting to hear. Uh, well, thank you so much for the time. This was enlightening. And uh, I can imagine that you guys talk about this stuff all day. Lucky you. And uh, until next time, this was a great conversation. Thank you for participating. And thank you for having me as your moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good seeing you both. <laughs>